watching France 24. Merci de nous rejoindre sur France 24. Tens of thousands of Syrian refugees pour in, across the border into Turkey as fighters from the Islamic State group continue a lightning strike across northern Syria. Rival presidential candidates in Afghanistan agree to share power. Just as the final tally of votes are to be released, a delayed result after earlier claims of foul play had suspended the count. And Pope Francis picks Albania for his first European trip, an example, he says, of a land where religions that are often in strife elsewhere cohabit successfully. Welcome back to the France Van Cat Newsroom. Well, over 60,000 Syrian Kurds poured into Turkey since Friday, fleeing intense clashes in the north Syrian province of Aleppo. There, the Islamic State group is said to have seized 63 villages in a lightning offensive and is still trying to take control of more towns along the border. Local Kurdish fighters are trying to push them back, but for now the violence is just pushing more civilians to flee. Gallagher Fenwick is on the Turkish side of the border, where those refugees are arriving by the busload. We actually hopped on one of these buses to uh, try and figure that out, and only, only to realize moments later that these people were literally being uh, taken to an empty parking lot where they were, well, somewhat being parked uh, out there, dropped off, told that from there on they had to uh, fend from them se for themselves and uh, given uh, pretty much absolutely no uh, assistance. That being said, I can tell you that these hundreds, thousands of people who had come across were very relieved uh, to be out there, no matter what the conditions that they had found themselves in on the Turkish side of the border, simply because they had just escaped uh, from uh, uh, the fighters belonging to the organization uh, of the Islamic State. But they were also very much aware that they had left everything behind them uh, in doing so, and that the next chapter in their lives was going to be a very complicated one. Men, women, children, very young children uh, with uh, pretty much nothing. Now, Gallagher, we know that Turkey has taken hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees since that war broke out over three years ago. How has, have authorities and indeed locals been reacted to this new influx? Well, uh, authorities eventually allowed these people to come in this after locals actually came close to the border and protested in order for those on the other side, on the Syrian side, to be allowed to come through. And you have to understand that on the Turkish side of the border, those who live close to the uh, 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 border are actually Kurdish, very much like those people coming through from the Syrian side. There was, there was a lot of fraternity, solidarity being expressed. We'll have to see how long that lasts, because when you have, you know, tens of thousands of people people being brought into small towns, even if there's some amount of solidarity. Uh, at first, uh, uh, all of these refugees with basically nothing to do, nowhere to go, uh, meandering aimlessly through the streets of this small town, that's bound to cause some friction. As far as authorities are concerned, it was very clear from the outset that Ankara, uh, Turkish authorities, were quite reluctant to let these people through. Turkey is already hosting a million and a half Syrian refugees uh, and very much wants uh, this humanitarian issue issue, or at least the next chapters of this issue, to be dealt with uh, elsewhere or, or, or in a different way, because the camps on the Turkish side are already completely overflowing, and Turkey just, just doesn't have any more infrastructure uh, to deal with uh, further waves uh, of refugees coming into its territory. After the worst three days of violence in years, which saw rebels take over in parts of the capital, Yemen may be on the road to peace. A UN envoy there says an agreement has been reached between the government and armed militia groups who've been fighting each other since Ali Abdullah Saleh was ousted from power in 2012. Catherine Dowling reports. Battling for control. After days of shelling, Shia Houthi rebels made their advance on Yemen's capital, Sana'a. Clashes here at the headquarters of the state TV station and other key buildings as government forces take on the militia. But after fears of a sectarian war, Yemen's agreed a truce with the rebels. Preparations for the signing of an agreement based on conclusions of the Conference of National Dialogue are underway. 
This agreement will be a national treaty, moving the country towards peaceful change. It will lay the foundation for a national partnership and the maintenance of security and stability in the country. So now it looks like the violence might be over. The agreement calls for an immediate ceasefire, promises to form a unity government and reduce fuel prices. Just before the announcement of the agreement, Yemeni authorities imposed a night curfew in the capital. The fighting had intensified in the past few days. Many families fled their homes, others were trapped. Universities, schools and shops were forced to close their doors. International flights were suspended. Shiite rebels from the Houthi tribe are calling for the ousting of a government they accuse of corruption. They want to say in the appointment of ministers. From their stronghold of Sadr in the north, Houthis are suspected of seeking to expand their area of influence in the future Yemeni federal state, which will have six provinces. The recent fighting has been the biggest challenge yet to the country's transition to democracy. Afghanistan's rival presidential candidates have ironed out a power-sharing deal and are about to sign that deal as the final vote count in elections that were held in June are released, a result that the two men say they will now respect after previous claims of fraud. You can see there preparations in Kabul are getting underway. We expect them to sign that deal shortly. Ashraf Ghani is expected to take the title of president with Abdullah Abdullah then. It's thought getting to pick the man, possibly himself, to be the chief executive officer, which is akin to the prime minister. Catherine Clifford reports. It was a record voter turnout on June 14th as 7 million Afghans went to cast their ballot. However, it wasn't to be a straightforward election. One of the two presidential candidates, Abdullah Abdullah, accused his rival Ashraf Ghani of fraud and called for vote counting to be suspended. In July, provisional results put Ghani in the lead with 56% of the vote, results which Abdullah immediately challenged. As concerns grew for a descent into the ethnic tensions that sparked civil war in the country in the 1990s, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry met with the two candidates and brokered to abide by the results of the audit. National unity. Two months later, the audit's now finished and. percent on all points. They've just settled the final details of an agreement to its third and final day of nationwide house arrest, a bid, the government said, to stop the spread of the Ebola virus and educate everyone about the disease as volunteers went door to door to talk to people about it. The success of the campaign is being questioned, however, as in some cases it only increased suspicions about health workers. Six million people confined to their homes. Sierra Leone is in lockdown. Friday, the entire country was placed under a 72-hour curfew to help stop the spread of the Ebola virus. The president urged people in Sierra Leone to cooperate. The government has declared a three-day stay-at-home host-to-host Ebola talk campaign to get this message to every house and family in the country. Free to Move Around is a team of 30,000 volunteers going door to door, hoping to find unreported cases of Ebola, educate people about the disease and hand out soap. But many residents were suspicious. The men gave us soap, but the problem is that some people said the soap would give you Ebola, so they pretended like they were going to use it and threw it away later. But me, I'll use the soap to wash my hands. Some aid workers said the sweeping operation may only increase suspicion of doctors and the health system. Others worried some of the volunteers were too young and could not effectively communicate with locals. Officials admitted the program had a rocky start, but that residents were complying more and more. Over 550 people have died from Ebola in Sierra Leone so far. Authorities are braced for a jump in the toll, expecting to uncover more patients and victims. 
Explosions have been reported in eastern Ukraine. A munitions factory in Donetsk was hit and blasts were also heard in the direction of the airport, which is currently held by government troops. The shelling comes just after news of a deal signed in Minsk that called for the withdrawal of heavy weapons along a 30-kilometre buffer zone, a move aimed at strengthening a ceasefire signed at the start of the month. Our correspondent Gulliver Craig is in Donetsk and bring us the view from there. Yesterday evening around 11.30 local time, heavy artillery fire could be heard from the centre of Donetsk. Sounded like it was coming from the north. The area around the airport there is the scene of constant battles. The Ukrainians are still in control of the airport. One question raised by this new ceasefire agreement is whether they are supposed to withdraw from there, seeing as they've agreed to withdraw their artillery 15 kilometres away from the artillery of the opposing side. Yesterday on the road from Lugansk to Donetsk, we did see troop movements. It's not clear whether or not these are Russian army troops or separatist forces with equipment supplied by the Russians. It's not clear either whether they were withdrawing 15 kilometres to create the 30-kilometre buffer zone.